All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are on First Chronicles chapter 13 today. It's 14 verses, and this will be the raw, uncut, Adam the Horseman version. Okay. Um, doing this on the fly, so we'll see what, what the Lord has for us. And uh, we know we all got Bible commentaries. We got study Bibles. Um, many learned people have gone before us and uh, have done a lot of work for us. We're very blessed this day and age to have commentaries, actually. Uh, even though sometimes there is leaven in them, uh, sometimes there's unbelief in some of them. Uh, some of these commentators, they don't have the full belief in the supernatural working of God for today. And some do. Some do and are very good. But nonetheless, we're very blessed to have all these resources because there are believers all over the world who don't have the kind of things that many of us here in America and elsewhere have. And even in history, uh, people would go to church to hear the word of God because not everybody even had Bibles. Well, we not only have Bibles, but we have commentaries from learned men. Uh, <laughs> we have all kinds of YouTube videos. We... um. We are very wealthy when it comes to these resources, and I, and I don't think that I'm grateful. I don't want to go off too much of a rant of it, but sometimes I think we should probably really just thank God for that and try not to take it for granted, because um, I know that I do. So let's let's pray again, if you would, that God would open His Word to us, because regardless of commentaries, what we really need, uh, in addition. We need primarily the Holy Spirit to guide us and to inspire us and to lead us into all truth, as he says. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would send uh, your Holy Spirit uh, who lives inside of us, the spirit of your son, but in a special way that you'd send your Holy Spirit to inspire us and to guide us and to teach us today as we open up your word and as we study uh, the life of, of David. In his battles, that we'd see how this relates to our life today and our battles in our lives. Uh, that you would be victorious in our battles, Lord, as we depend on you because of who you are. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we'll just read it. It'll be a short read. I'm going to just read through it probably, and maybe I'll stop and talk, or maybe I'll, I'll talk throughout. I don't know. So we'll begin verse 1 and following. And by the way, if I have any background noise, forgive me. I have my, my vacuum cleaner on, had it on all day. I have a yellow jacket nest in my ground. <laughs> and I looked it up. There could be like four or 5,000 of those little guys. And uh, I did get stung once, but I'm trying to suck them all up and dig, dig, dig the nest out. So that, that's a good time, sort of. It is kind of interesting. Um, so there's that background noise that you may or may not hear. All right. Uh, now we read uh, verse one and following. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, it seemed good unto you and that it be of the Lord our God. Let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel and with them also to the priests and the Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregations said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shehor of Egypt, even unto the entering of Himath to bring the ark of God from Kirath Jerem. And David went up and all Israel to Bala, that is Kirjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwells between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah, and Aoya drove the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of 
Chidon, Uzan put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore the place is called Peret Perezua Zuzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David, but carried it aside unto the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Dum in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house Obed-Dum and all that he had. Okay. So here in the first verse, we see that David is consulting with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with them every leader. Uh, we'd already seen in, in chapter 12 where, where the army was already organized by this, this leadership. In order to have a good army, you have to have good leaders. You have to have men that will lead. And David couldn't lead the army by himself. He had to have seasoned warriors. And, of course, chapter 12 shows how valiant many of these warriors were uh, that wanted to be on uh, David's side and not Saul's because they knew that David was blessed by God. They wanted to be in God's blessing. And so it's it's good that David, being a good king and a good ruler, is willing to consult and even get advice. A good, a good ruler, a good king, even a good pastor wants to get advice because they realize that at the end of the day, they're really not that special. <laughs> That that they are, but they're not. We're all we're all in it together. That everybody has a role, and God speaks to the entire people, and God has a place for everybody, and God has a place for me, and He has a place for you. And so uh, it's it's good that David's consulting uh, with these captains of thousands and hundreds, and with every leader. And so that way they could also be on the same page. David could share his concerns. The leaders could share their concerns. They could get on the same page. And then that could that could trickle down uh, to the soldiers. So everybody would have their their proper place and order, and the whole thing would work as a as a machine. That's how it works in the military. It's a it's a machine. Everybody has a, a place, and uh, there's a there's a chain of of command. And uh, if you want to do something, there's a proper way to do it. You don't just jump over your boss's head. To you know, you'd only do that in case of an emergency. If it really had to happen in case uh, your supervisor was doing an absolutely terrible, unethical job, then there would be a place for that. But but uh, you would never do that under normal circumstances. So things are proper and in good order here. Uh, and David said unto all the congregation of Israel, if it seemed good unto you and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also the priests and Levites, which are in the cities and suburbs, that may gather themselves unto us. So um, uh, earlier, like I said, in chapter 12, we saw that even the Levites were willing to fight, even though the Levites were the priests, they had their particular cities. Um, nonetheless, in, in times of an emergency, they, they would fight too. But here... It seems like they are going to resume their normative duties, um, which is to serve the Lord, to offer the sacrifices, um, even to order the worship, you know, of God. And so David is 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 wanting to normalize his 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 rule here, if you will. And so let them bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And so David realizes that they're not complete without the presence of God. That is without the full presence of God, because we know that although God, even in this time, is everywhere, that, that God reigns in heaven, you know, the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool for he is holy it says in the psalms and that was written at a time where god did dwell in the ark of the covenant and so god is, in, in, in a way is uncircumscribable he's incontainable like he's god you can't 
you can't keep him in a box. You can't. Nonetheless, he can keep himself wherever he wants to the degree that he wants to. And he did chose to dwell in a particular way, in a special way, with his people in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, both when it was in uh, the tent, the meeting, uh, when it was paraded before the people, you know, um, when he went before his people, he circumscribed himself in the, the pillar of flame to some sense. He showed himself in that way. Uh, and he dwelt in the temple where all the, the nations could know that the God of Israel was there with his people. And so um, Israel, in order to be complete, they need the leading of, of their God. They need his presence, his full presence. And so they, they want the ark. They want the protection of, of, of the Lord. And so, and so all the congregations, so they would do this thing. And then we see in verses five and following, as we've already read, they, David is, is positioning himself to bring the ark so that the God would be fully present with his people. And um, it says in verse six, and David went up and all of Israel to Balath, that is to Jareth at the rim. Of course, Baal was, was, uh, was, the the name of the the pagan god uh, that dwelt in in Canaan, but Baal just means Lord. I mean, it's you know not not to scandalize you, because perhaps you will. We we know that say for instance Allah is is the name of the god that the the Muslims worship, uh, which was a name that uh, preceded even uh, the revelation, the so called uh, given to Muhammad. Uh, nonetheless, it is a generic name for God. So much that uh, Arab Christians, even before Islam even came into existence, would use that name. In Arabic, it just means God. Kind of like the word God in English is a Germanic word, meaning God in a very generic sense. So in order to know the true God, you not have to know who this God is. And for us, that is the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God revealed according to the scriptures. So anyway, don't be too put off when sometimes you see uh, Baal being used in some sort of positive sense. It's not talking about the false god Baal. And so David went up on all of Israel to Baalath, that is to Gareth Jerem, um, which belonged to Judah, to bring hence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwelt between the cherubims. Here, you know, do we know that cherubims were these angelic beings depicted as winged bull type um, throne bearers in the ancient world, that these Balim were even, they were found in the other religions surrounding Israel and Canaan, these, these type of depictions. Yet, in, in the revelation of God, they are depicted as actually bearing up the one true God of Israel, of, of, of Yahweh, these, these Balim, or these, I'm sorry, these cherubim, would, or these, these winged winged beings and uh elsewhere in scripture they're seen as 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 high high ranking angels angelic beings so even sometimes you know uh the satan is referred to as some type of cherub although others like to see him as some type of seraph of archangel rank there is some discussion there uh, nonetheless the Lord, but it is significant that the Lord is described as dwelling between the cherubims, uh, showing that that because um, again, they're the cherubs are the ones that exalt the Lord. They're the ones that bear up the God, and in this context, the ones that bear up the one true God uh, between the cherubim, uh, whose name is called on it, and so. And uh, it is interesting, uh, you know, Israel was not allowed to make any images. The people weren't allowed to make images because they would get confused and they would fall into idolatry. Yet God did in certain times for certain purposes uh, require some type of imagery. Uh, we see this in the in the temple itself, that there was some type of imagery that the, the priests would see when they entered the Holy of Holies. And... Um, very, you know, nothing, nothing like the later Catholic and Orthodox things that they would do in their churches for everyone to, to bow down before and venerate. Nothing like that. That would that would be what uh, the Bible would uh, not want people to do. 
nonetheless, these these cherubs were seen by people. They were they were angelic depictions that people could see. Is my point. So you do have some of that in the tabernacle and temple. And so, um, so they carry the ark of God and a new part of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah and and uh, Anoi drove the cart. So there, you know, God, they want God in their presence, but you have to be, we have to be cognizant. God is holy. You know, I, I think if sometimes, you know, we, we always want the presence of God, but we have to realize this because some people are very trite with this. And they want to, people want a carnival, a circus to go on at church where the, the, oh, it's the presence of God. People are acting like monkeys in a zoo. <laughs> And I'm like, I did, that's that's not the presence of God. The presence of God was a very holy and otherworldly, in some sense, a sober thing and an awesome thing. When I say the word awesome, I don't just mean like super cool. I mean, you want to get down on your face and worship uh, because the holiness, the otherness of God in the Old Covenant and sometimes even in the New Testament could um, could bring death could bring judgment and uh, that's just the truth of the matter you can't read the bible and not see this reality and so uh, they want to be careful with the presence of god they want to be prepared for the presence of god uh, not only in the holiness of their lives of their interior sanctification but also in just how they approach god in general if god wants to be approached a certain way then you need to approach him that way and um Israel was was to not not just anybody could touch the Ark of the Covenant, for instance. We see many examples of people dying when they did so. Uh, we see people examples of people who presumed to take priesthood upon themselves dying for altering false incense, that sort of thing. And this is what's going on here. And so it says, David and all Israel played before God with all their might. Nonetheless, uh, they even though God was to be feared because he was holy, who's also loved because he's good and he's God. And, and so they're, they're playing, they're, they're offering their lives unto God. They're, they're playing, they're singing. And uh, we know, you know, David, even at least one time, probably others, he danced before God and said so other places they would dance before God too. And so they're offering God everything. And so I think a lot of Christians with the gospel here in this nation it is true that we must come to a place of surrender our, of our lives to his lordship and, and belief and trust and his sacrifice in order that, that God might change us, that we might become born from above by faith, by grace through faith. All this is true, but we've turned this very often into like sort of an, an easy believism sometimes. Um, whereas Jesus says to the disciples, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That you read the Gospel of Mark in the first two chapters, and he says, come and follow me. I don't even know how many times, 17, 8, 20 times in one chapter. It's, it's a very high number. He says, follow me, and they left their boats, and they left their father in the boat, says of James and John, to follow Jesus. And so, in other words, the whole point of us even becoming disciple, born again is to be a disciple of Jesus to offer our whole lives unto him, everything. So Amen. although we are saved by grace through faith, uh, ultimately we're safe. We're saved unto allegiance, received unto discipleship. And so he's, he, he's to be our God. We're to follow him. And so they, they, they uh, dedicated all that they danced before the Lord. They, and here in this verse, they played with all their might with, with singing. They offer their whole lives. And like I, I think I'm trying to get to some people just want to say they've said a prayer to receive Jesus, but then they don't, they live like the world or they just go to God for help when things get rough in their lives. Amen. And I'm not, I'm not above this. Like when things get rough in my life, I definitely go to him more. I ain't going to lie to you. You know, I, that's not, I'm going to judge myself in that sense to some degree. It's true. But we have to realize that God is, our God, whether things go for us the way we want to or not, he is God. He's King Jesus on the throne, and he's the one that saved us. And so we are, he's due all of our glory, all of our honor, all of our life, 
every breath, let everything that breathes praise the Lord. So if you're breathing, you should be praising Amen. Him. Amen. Amen. For every single day that you get to wake up and smile at what God has done in your life and the people that you know and the people that you can be a blessing to. Just like David and all Israel played before God with all their might. And, and here we see that the ark is being prepared to come unto them in, in verse 9 and following. It says that, that Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark. Why? And he did it even innocently. In a sense, it looks like it because the oxen stumbled. He's just trying to steady it to keep it from falling down. Nonetheless, the anger of the Lord was kindled against him. Perhaps he should have let it go, realizing that if God wanted it to tumble, it was going to tumble. Or perhaps he would have kept it from happening. And so God smote him. And so, so perhaps it wasn't just a reflex. He thought, I'm going to keep this from falling when he knew the rules were otherwise. So in other words, we should that should cause us to pause and say, you know what? I'm not going to take things into my own understanding in my own hands, even if I think it's important. Even if I'm trying to save a situation, I'm trying to be a hero. Sometimes maybe I shouldn't be a hero. Sometimes maybe I should just do what I, I know God says is best, even if it causes somebody else to struggle a little bit, even if it causes myself to struggle, whatever the case may be. God smote him. He was angry. I don't think God was angry for no reason. I think God had his reasons and he communicated those to his people. And so... He smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And it says, David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Therefore, the place is called Perazuzah to this day. So David had a hard time with it. God's bigger than David. I don't know that God was overly, like, all that concerned that, <laughs> or you know what I mean? His, God is still God. David is not God. Uh, but even David, he's probably a little confused. David's still learning about God, and sometimes we're confused. I don't understand everything. The more I know, the more I forget, the older I get, <laughs> and the more I realize I don't know. I don't have it all figured out. I, I don't. I go to God like a little kid and said, Lord, help me. And there's things I'm learning. There's things that that I don't understand. I just have to trust you because you're God. You're the creator of the universe. You're the one who put the stars in the sky. You're the one who loved me so much that you sent your son to die for me. And, and Jesus did that willingly on my behalf through great pain and great turmoil, knew what he was getting into, and he chose to do that for me. You do that for me, I'll offer my life and everything to you. Thank you, even though I don't understand much more than that. But David, David's honest. Read the Psalms. He's honest. He was displeased um, because the Lord had, had done this upon Uzzah. And so, um, and it says David was afraid of God that day. David's learning that God is not just, you know, I don't think he ever thought that God was just his buddy. But sometimes we could just think of him that way or that he's just our friend, although he is. Um, so David is afraid of God that day. I think, I think that we would do well, even though we're all, we are in the new covenant, that things have changed. And we don't have the sacrificial system the same way. We don't have the holiness and purity laws the way that they had them in the Old Testament. I get it. Uh, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit in the way that they were not. Uh, we could come boldly to the throne of grace in the way that they could not. So things have changed. Nonetheless, God in his nature has not changed. It's the same God. And God has always had a son. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we have to realize that we we could do with a bit more reverence in our churches today, I would say. Amen. A bit more sense of the holiness of God. And, um, and so David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? And so David's like recognizing maybe I'm not ready for this yet. Maybe Maybe I'm not ready for this next stage of my ministry and my life. Maybe I need to spend more time seeking the Lord, examining my heart. Maybe I need to spend more time repenting, you know, to see if there be any wicked way in me. 
you know, uh, God has a timing for our lives. Yes, that's yeah. true that he's already given us every blessing through, through Christ. We already have it all in some sense. But in another sense, we need to wait on the Lord to let him bring these realities to manifest in his time because he's God and we're not. And we can, if we're not careful, we in our flesh can get ahead of the Holy Spirit's work in our life out of our own pride and out of our own immaturity. And that's why, for instance, it says that the new converts shouldn't be teachers in the church, lest they become prideful, that's lest they right. be arrogant. Amen. And you see a lot of people, they get radically saved and praise God. You know, these people, they, 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 were, they were very much outside of Christ. So then when they become in Christ, they remember who they were. And they, they remember the moment they were born again and, and the sweetness and the love and the mercy. They, they know they're a new creation. And they're forever grateful, but then they then their zealousness, they sometimes bite off too much. They seek too much, and they seek to become teachers and to, to lord themselves over others because they, they're zealous. But the reality is God is very often not in as much of a hurry as we are. And we could try to rush God. And we don't want to, when we rush God, that's to find fault with him. And so... Perhaps David has taken a step back here. I don't know, but maybe he's saying, you know what? God is maybe holier than I thought even. And so I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be careful with this thing. And I'm going to do this appropriately. So David is afraid of God saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So that David brought not the ark home to himself, to the city of David. Now we know he eventually will bring the ark to Jerusalem. Of course, but not today. Not today. And so the question for me and you is, what is God saying to us today in our lives? What does he want for us today? Amen. Yesterday's gone. Forget about it. It's gone. The future will is the future. We don't know the future. God knows the future. We know certain things about it that he's revealed in his word, or perhaps he shared things through the discourse of our lives. But today is the day of salvation in that sense. As for me and my house, we were served the Lord. Yes, but that happens today. And so, uh, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of obed the Gittite. So this was a man that David sense would be able to, to bear the burden of the ark through, through God's grace. So that's where it was. And the ark of God remained with the family of obed in his house three months. I don't even know who this this was. I'd have to look it up. Maybe he was significant. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe God just wants to dwell with the humble. You yes. Know? Maybe just just maybe God wants to dwell with those who aren't trying to seek after their own kingdoms, that just want to serve Him, that just that are just satisfied in Him, that aren't trying to exalt themselves, that are willing to humble themselves that God may exalt them in due time. In his time, that is. And so God remained with his family, and it says that the Lord blessed his house, the house of Abedam, and all that he had. And so I think God needs to be the one that's orchestrating all this. And David is realizing that not him. It wasn't his responsibility to orchestrate what God does for the nation of Israel, but he needed to wait on the Lord and let the Lord guide his people. And we need to wait on the Lord and let him guide our own lives as well. That's my reading. <clears throat> God bless you guys. What a great message that was once again, Brother Adam coming in and doing First Chronicles 13. I'm just going to add a very straight up, he did such a great job. I hope you brothers and sisters out there enjoy the teaching today. It was one of the better ones I've heard in a long time on First Chronicles 13. And just to back up his teaching out of uh, the Thomas Nelson uh, short commentaries, a unanimous decision is not always a right decision. And an enthusiasm is not the best test of truth. Where David's motives today in this chapter mixed as he sought to bring the ark home to Jerusalem. 
because we all know that the ark had to be carried and they decided they were going to put it on a cart and that was not God's will and that was not the instructions the way God wanted the ark the, the tabernacle the ark of the covenant to be transported as we learned that from Moses was the king subtly promoting himself as well as glorifying God and that's in the first four verses today perhaps he was one thing is sure David did not pause to seek the Lord's direction in the venture he ran to a multitude of counselors it was his habit prior to seek the will of God before he acted but that time he failed and any Levite could have told them how to do the job. And, and that means that the uh, tabernacle had to be carried, not put on a cart. Just the simplest of simplest. And one of the things this morning I read to everybody, brothers and sisters, when we were having our uh, open comment on the chapter, was that the ark was God's throne so i i pulled out of the scriptures uh psalm 91 not 91 99 i'm sorry I'm grabbing my bible because i want you all to hear this because the word of god is very important in our walks it's the final truth the lord reigneth psalm 99 it's the holiness of god the lord reigneth let the people tremble he sitteth between the cherubims let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loved judgment. Thou hast established equity. Thou hast executed judgment and righteousness in Jacob, which became Israel. Ex exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. And it edifies the fact that Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies, very important brothers and sisters, and the ordinance that he gave them. And that's what David failed to do because he, he wanted to get all Israel back together, but he didn't go to God and seek God's fullness in the situation of moving the tabernacle. And that's why God allowed it to go elsewhere for the moment. Thou answered them, O Lord, our God. Thou was a God that forgavest them, though they took us vengeance of their inventions. And the closing verse in Psalm 99 teaches us to exalt the Lord our God, worship on his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. And whenever I hear the holy hill, I think about the book of Obadiah, how upon Mount Zion, there will be deliverance in God's house. And today, there's much of that needed in the body of Christ. And, you know, if David would have posed it was his habit to speak the will of God before he ever acted as we studied King David over the earlier uh, chapters in the Old Testament. But this time he failed. So the Levites, they knew because they were called by God to move the ark. The ark was God's throne, as I just read to you. The holiness of God and the throne of God does not depend on the hand of man for support or protection. Had the ark been where it belonged on the shoulders of the Levites, Uzzah would have lived. No matter how successful at the beginning a man's methods without God will ultimately fail. The time to find out how to do his work is before the job begins, not after the funeral. So that's that's the uh, Thomas Nelson short commentary on the read 
of First Chronicles 13. And then I want to add into the ending for everybody. I want to bring in this song. It's a modern contemporary song written by some young men. And just, you'll see the words. I'm sharing screen. Let me, I didn't share screen. Let me go back and do this. Share screen. Right. Got it now. Enjoy the closing song. All the things that I've held dear, the vanities that whispered in my ear. What would I do if they all disappeared? Riches and fame and all that they could buy I've come to find they never satisfy What would I gain if my soul's a prize? I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world does I only want you First, I seek your will, not my own. Surrender all my wants to you. Keep the first thing first. To live your truth, walk your ways, set my eyes. Lord, I fix my face on you. All my desires reverse. To keep the first thing first I give it all, my life in offering My heart is yours, so have your way in me Your kingdom's all I want to see I don't want to love what the world loves No, I don't want to chase what the world does I Desires reverse to keep the 